We're in the book of Romans, an amazing, amazing, astonishing book. Uh, really, it's about justification. It's about how we're made right with God. In fact, if you remember, instead of going back through, we did a pretty extensive review last week. This week, I just want to remind you guys that 1 through, uh, through 11, well, chapters 1 through 11, is really about you and God. It's really about how you think in your mind, how you understand, and how you have a relationship with the living Lord of the universe. 1 through 11 is predominantly about you and God. Chapters 12 through 16 is about you and others. This is about how you think. This is about how you act. And that's really the breakdown to a large degree um, of the book of Romans. And so chapters 1 through 11 is descriptive. Chapters 12 through 16 is really prescriptive. This is what you're thinking, so this is how you're to act in light of that. And so um, if you look at chapters 1 through 11 as how to rebel against the world in your thought process, to think differently than the world, which by the way, James did an amazing job this morning in the equipping hour right now at 9 a.m. We're going through a book called We Will Not Be Silenced, and we're talking about the philosophies of this world and how they run contrary, and that's true whether you're Republican or Democrat, they run contrary to Jesus. And so we're about Jesus, we follow Jesus, we believe Jesus, we believe that he has the right morals, that he has the right ethics, that he has the right direction, that he has the right path, and so we follow Jesus and not these other philosophies. But the philosophies of this world now are permeating our culture and around this globe, and it's just a really good study. So we would encourage you to join with us at 9 o'clock on Sunday mornings uh, for Erwin Lutzer is the one who really wrote the study, but we're studying through it and kind of looking at the scriptures in light of all these philosophies. But chapters 1 through 11 is us rebelling against all the world's philosophies and believing what God said about who he is, who we are, and about repentance and faith and how we get made right with God, and that's his choosing and, and our faith, that, that he chooses us and we believe in him, and ultimately we're granted righteous standing with God. And so then in chapters 12 through 16... It's really about what it looks like to rebel against the world in regards to our actions, behavior, and in regards to dealing with other people. So we rebel against God, uh, rebel against the world in our thoughts and then in our actions. Because remember, the world is rebelling against God, so we're rebelling against the world. We are those who are following Jesus, who was the ultimate rebel that ever walked this planet. And so really the hinge, if you will, in this book is Romans 12, 2, and he says this, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. So Romans 12, 2 is the hinge in this book where we switch from our thoughts on God, our relationship in God, to our actions towards our fellow man, towards one another and others. And it really comes down to not being conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's really a life of rebelling against this world. And this is only, uh, the, the option is available to us, but it's only available to Christians. All the world is being conformed to the image of the world. That's true whether you're on the right or left. You're being conformed to the image of this world. But Christians alone and uniquely have the opportunity to be transformed by the renewing of their mind because of the Word of God and the Spirit of God that convicts us that the Word of God is true and teaches us the Word of God and encourages us with the Word of God. So we have that as an opportunity as God's followers. But it's not an option for the majority of the world. And so we look at what Jesus said and we say, oh man, he has a much better way of life, right? He is calling us to a path that's far different than the rest of the world is looking at. And really, we're looking at the fact that, and we've seen several different elements of this rebelling against the world, and today we're going to deal with quit being selfish, right? Because really what being, uh, the world is in, firmly ingrained in selfishness. In fact, as we've seen, as we've looked in the, through the book of Romans, we understand, and this is a big difference between what the Bible says and the philosophies of the world. The Bible says we're instinctively selfish, right? We're instif- instinctively self-centered, and, and the world's saying, no, we're instinctively good. God says we're instinctively evil. The world says, no, we're, we're intrinsically good. What happens is, because the world is born selfish, by, we're, we're selfish and sinful by nature and by choice, and so you don't have to, we have to train, we have a... 15-month-old, 16-month-old, I, I kind of lose track. But we, ha- we have to train them in a lot of things, right? You have to train them to eat with a spoon this way rather than this way. You have to train them to do just about everything except what? Being selfish. Don't have to train them at all being selfish. And lo and behold, 
He knows it really good. He knows how to be selfish. In fact, we have to train and work hard to train him not to be selfish because it's so ingrained in him. And that travels throughout life. So we're really talking about the, what we're going to do today is quit being selfish because we have to choose to rebel against selfishness and become a servant. Because that's the opposite, right? You're either selfish or you're a servant. If you're not a servant, you're selfish. And there are some people that seem good and loving and kind who are very selfish, It's just that they're loving and kind towards other people for selfish reasons. But as Christ followers, we're to rebel against this world, quit being selfish, and we're to start being uh, servants, which is the the opposite. And because it's selfishness is the pattern of this world. Selfishness is the default mode for all people in this world. Selfishness is what's tearing this world apart. And selfishness is not only destroying our lives and relationships, it's selfishness that has us on a direct course to hell and why Jesus has to rescue us, right? But Jesus was the most unselfish person who ever walked the earth. In fact, to walk in love as Jesus did is to live an unselfish life. An unselfish life. And so, um, selfishness is, how does this benefit what? How does this benefit me? Selfishness is, what do I gain from this, right? Selfishness is, what do I get out of this? It's always me, me, me. The world says the solution to your problem is to become more selfish, right? We call it self-esteem, self-love. But essentially, the world is telling you in our culture, your problem is you don't love yourself enough. And God is saying just the opposite. Your problem is you love yourself too much. You really need to fall in love with God and love other people, and you'll find your life. Hmm. So the what's in it for me? What do I gain? This is all the selfishness. Love is what's best for you. How can I bless you? How can I serve you? What is love is about God and others. In fact, that's why Jesus, in the Cliff Notes version of the Bible, tells us what? He sums it all up in two commandments. Does anyone know what those two commandments are? Give me one commandment. Mason. What? You can phone a friend, man. Oh, Brian was like, he just broke into sweat, like a cold sweat there. Yeah, love your neighbors yourself is one of them. Very good. He's like, you can breathe, breathe. Okay, yeah. His parents, you're always going like, man, don't call on my kids because they on the spot might not get it right. But that you did. Summarize the Bible in two commands. One of them is love your neighbors yourself. What's the other? Jed. What's the other, man? Make sure you're awake back there. What's the other command? If you summarize the entire Bible in two commands like Jesus did, love your neighbors yourself. What's the other one? It's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, right? And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, this is the summation of everything in the Bible. Hmm. And so it's about love. It's about rebelling against the selfish world and becoming a servant. It's about re- rebelling against self-love and loving God and others. And so we're going to pick back up. And we talked about last week in subjection to government. We're going to deal with a couple of verses here about that as we head into this. Uh, Quit being selfish and be a servant, right? But he says this in verse 5 of chapter 13 of Romans. Therefore, it is necessary to be in subjection not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. So we're kind of picking up a little bit before we left off where we left off last week. And, And so he says... The, the government, that is their one main job, is to protect people, right? Is to keep people safe so that people can go about their life and work a job and, and enjoy family and walk on the streets and not be in danger or threat for their life or their well-being or anything like that. Because their one job is to protect, right? To, to protect the citizenship, to enforce the laws so that lawbreakers will be punished in a way that good flourishes. They're to punish evil so good would flourish. And he says, so... We're to rebel against the world, if you remember, by submitting to authority because um, not only because of wrath, not only because we would be the ones who would get punished, but because of conscience. Because this is what Jesus said. So as God's followers, we say, man, if I'm going to love Jesus, I'm going to love others, I need to what? We, as we kind of picking up at the tail end of last week's, we need to rebel against the world that's rebelling against authority, and we need to submit to authority, Right? We need to submit to authority, not only because of what punishment might come to us if we disobeyed, but because of our conscience, because this is what God said. Whatever God said, that's what, uh, that's what goes for us. Verse 6, for because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers, are servants of God, devoting themselves to this very thing. So when we talk about stop being selfish, but instead love and be a servant to others, it's interesting that he ties it to money, right? Why does the Bible, have you noticed this? The Bible often ties love and money together. 
Have you ever thought of any other passages that tie love and money together? You cannot got love what? You cannot love God and money. Love and money are often tied together in this regard. He says, for, because of this, you also pay taxes for rulers or servants of God. I don't know if you thought about that, but rulers, those in authority, mayors, governors, presidents, whatever, are servants of God. That is, God has a structure in place, and these individual governing civic authorities, even though many times they themselves are corrupt or uh, wrong in a lot of their thinking, are still being used by God to bring about a greater good, right? Now, for us, we recognize the greater good. We appreciate that there's roads and bridges, that there's police officers and EMS workers, and that there's all of these things. And we appreciate that. We recognize that, and certainly uh, happy to... Uh, pay taxes for that. And there's other things that we're much less happy about paying taxes towards. And certainly, as we're going to look at some of these things, we, we, we think of our own, the silliness of our government oftentimes that's borrowed, what, $85,000 from every, basically, in, in for every uh, uh, citizen in the, in the country, which is just craziness. Uh, but it really, re- government officials are a reflection of a culture, right? And so when, the more the culture rejects the morals of God, the more the leaders will do likewise because they come from uh, as a reflection of the culture. But we're to pay taxes, right? And, it, and if you ever hear of a Christian who doesn't pay their taxes and uh, thinks that they're doing a good job, oh, I don't like how they spend my money, I'm not going to pay my taxes, they're going to have a great opportunity to do prison ministry, but from where? From prison, right? You know, that's not us, right? So we pay our taxes, right? In fact, he goes on and he says, uh, For because of these shall pay, also pay taxes for rulers and servants of God, devoting themselves to very thing. So verse 7, render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due. And this is really an individual thing. This is you paying tax, whether it's on your income or your property, whatever. Custom, doom, custom. And these were taxes just in regards to all of the various products you might be you know, buying or selling, but tax that was due. Uh, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. So he says, man, as Christians... We recognize that this world is a fallen world. We recognize it's anything but perfect. And at the same time, we come under authority, don't we? This is a reflection not only rebelling against the world, but it's a reflection of submitting to God. It's a reflection that we're dying to ourselves. We're not going along with the selfish pattern of this world, but we're going along with the selfless pattern of Christ. And so we come under authorities. But he says, he goes and builds on that. He says, owing nothing to anyone except to... Anyone know what it is? Except to love one another, right? Hmm. Except to love one another. And so what happens is, yes, we submit to authority, and we come under authority, and we respect those, and we should, there should be a level of respect that you feel for the mayor, the governor, the president, the vice president. That wouldn't matter what election cycle, Right? Why? Because of the role they play, they they play, they are in a position where God says to honor them because of their position, we do what? We honor them because of their position. We talked about this more thoroughly last week. And when they say, this is the tax it's due, we pay the tax it's due, right? It's not to say that you know, certainly those with greater wealth seem to figure out a whole lot of uh, strategies and loopholes. We're not saying that hey, those are legit within the confines of the law, more power to you. But we work within the confines of the law. We come under those in authority. But ultimately, all these things lead us back to owe oh, nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. What law? What law? When we talk about the law. What are we often referring to? The ten, the ten Commandments. When he refers to, there's a lot more commands than that in the Old Testament, but it's boiled down to ten, and Jesus simplifies it to two. But it's the Ten Commandments, right? As we've seen already in the book of Romans, every person is still subject to the laws of God. They're still subject to the Ten Commandments. It's only in Christ that the law is fulfilled on our behalf. Otherwise, they will be judged by it. They, and it's as sure as you're, you're governed by the law of gravity today. You can tell me all day long that you're not governed by the law of gravity, but you're still governed by the law of gravity, right? Everything you do is subject 
to the law of gravity. In the same way, everything you do is subject to the law of God, the Ten Commandments. And you will ultimately be judged on that basis. And that's why we who know the Ten Commandments, we realize we have broke all the commands. And the commands aren't, as people suggest, this stuffy, old, religious, bygone era. They're actually the reflection of perfect love. You want to see the Ten Commandments perfectly lived out, you can look at the life of Jesus. He perfectly lived out the Ten Commandments. So we live in a culture that says, man, that's archaic. Get it off the wall. Get it out of here. Get it out of public squares. We want that done away with. We want that backward standard thrown out. But Jesus says, I perfectly live the law. If you perfectly live the law, then you perfectly live in love because that's what the law is. So he says, um, owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. This not only includes that you make sure that you're paying, man, you're giving honor to whom honor is due, fear to whom fear is due, and also that you're paying your taxes, but it reflects that we are to, as God's people, we're not to be indebted, right? We realize in the scriptures, he says that the slave, the, 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 low, the borrower becomes slave to the what? Lender. So you're not to be in inordinate debt. You see, a lot of times what happens in our culture is in America, we love to borrow, right? There's a lot of people who borrow. They borrow on their credit cards. They borrow for their cars. They borrow for their school. They borrow all these things. And before you know it, they start working. They realize, what are you trying to get to? I'm trying to get back to zero, right? Like, I'm in debt for my car. I'm in debt for my school. I'm in debt for my credit card. I'm just trying to get back to, to zero. You know what happens a lot of times? They make choices that don't reflect love, do they? They can't love their families often when they get married, when they have kids. They can't be around their kids often or not nearly as involved as they should be. They can't love the body of Christ. They can't serve others. Why? Because they're usually saying, I got to take this job. Well, that job sounds terrible. That sounds way too many hours. You can't have a, a family on that many hours. I don't have any choice. Why? I'm in debt. You see, as God's people, when he talks about owing nothing to anyone, is we don't need outstanding debts, whether it's honor, fear, respect, taxes, or being indebted to others in some inordinate way. What you want to do is say, you know, uh, you live within your means so that you can love God and others, so that you're not compelled to go, man, i got to work all these overtime hours. Well, what about the kids? They would love to have you go to the game. They'd love to go to the park with you. Your, your spouse would love to be around you. You'd, oh, I can't. I had to take a job that doesn't fit with any of that because I'm paying debts. That's not a Christian mindset, is it? That's a very secular, selfish mindset. The reason why we live in a culture that's so indebted is because we're so selfish, right? And so what he's talking about is we generally, as God's people, need to, as diligently as possible, not be in debt so that we can be freed up to love, whether it's loving our spouse, our kids, our neighbor, the body of Christ. I can remember back when Jennifer and I were married, we had her old red topaz. This was like a, a little dinky car, I guess a little girly car, and red always fades. It was like, oh, gosh, good grief, you know? And I had this old pickup truck, and uh, I liked the old truck. It had a dent in the side and all that, but, you know, I can remember a relative going, why don't you go buy a new car? You can afford the payments. Look at for 350 bucks, you can go buy a new car. Because you know where that 350 bucks goes? That's the money I give to the Lord. I'll drive a beater and live debt-free to give to the Lord. Well, why would you do that? The church already owns a building. I don't think you understand. Like, this is the Lord of the universe I'm giving to you. So if giving God the first fruits means I can't afford a new car, then I drive an old car as worship to my creator. Your creator doesn't want you to drive an old car. That's exactly what he wants me to do. And he wants me to be thankful, whether I'm driving a beater. I should have tinted the windows on that thing. I never liked being seen in that thing. Uh, whether it was driving the topaz, I could still give thanks to God, even though it just didn't quite fit me. Or, uh, but praise God. You see, what you want to do is, do you know what the first thing you bring in is? It's God's. And as a family, we looked at the Old Testament and said, in the Old Testament, it was 10%, right? Then Jesus comes and piles all kinds of stuff on us, way better than they had back then, right? So we didn't look at the floor, 10% as the ceiling, we looked at it as the floor. So we say, okay, we're going to start from 10% and give the Lord. First fruits, it's just God's. Secondly, you know who gets their money? The government gets their money. Give the government their money, right? 
so we don't have to visit you in jail. Give the government their money. You know what third you need to put in your budget? In the Old Testament, it was called offerings, right? It was money that you had in reserve so that when the person, your friend or person at church or whoever needed groceries, you had a buffer there and you could give them groceries. Oh, they need a car and you can help chip in to get them a car. They need and have needs and you say, oh, so you go God, taxes, others, and you live off the rest. You say, well, that, <laughs> that would never work because that would be like way less. Yeah. Yeah, you would not be selfish. if you, You're going to have to be very selfless to do that. I told one guy, you need to be more margin. You better, you better have your air conditioning turned up a bit so you can save a little money. I would not do that. Well, you probably need to get rid of your fancy phone plan. Never. I couldn't do without that. You know when he went down the list? He couldn't live without any of those things. So he said, well, I can't help you. You're in debt and you're sinking. And because you're so selfish... You're not willing to give up anything. Do you know most of the things that we consider as needs were not even a part of life not that long ago, right? They didn't even have air conditioning that long ago. They did, certainly didn't have fancy phone plans or fancy internet plans or all these things we think that we have to have. What I'm saying is, oh no man, nothing is to not have inordinate debt. It's to live within your means, and I'm telling you, you'll have a lot better standard of life even though you have much less in life. You'll pass by places and you'll see people in their fancy Audi and their big house and you're like, oh man, they got so much money. They probably just have so much debt. And probably every day they're under huge, huge pressure in life trying to go, man, I got to keep making money. How am I going to make enough money to keep all these things going? That isn't a Christian worldview. That isn't a Christian perspective. You know what a Christian perspective is? God gets first. Government gums next. I get help the people around me. I live off the rest. And you know what? Living off the rest... Man, Jennifer and I have lived off the rest, and it meant peanut butter and tuna and ramen. And I don't eat tuna anymore. Praise God. You know, I mean, this stuff's okay. But I ate way too many cans of that. You know what I'm saying? And so that, and, but you give thanks to God. For some of you, the remainder is you may be able to have a, a steak dinner every weekend and enjoy some good food, and it's fine. God allows us to have different things. And you know what? The idea of fairness that our culture so loves and embraces and calls Christian isn't Christian, it's pagan. I hate to tell you, but the God of the Bible is not fair. And so if you're worshiping because he's fair, you're in the wrong classroom. Just read the Bible, you'll realize he's not fair by any standard of measure you and I put on fairness. So what you need to decide is, if I'm not going to owe anyone anyone, I give God first, I pay my taxes, I have offerings or things to help others, I live off the rest, and that's going to be way different between Brandon and James and Brian and myself, right? It's different. And whatever your position is, you give thanks, right? You give thanks. And you know what? I praise God, man. So, you, you know, some people, their position is they could go buy a new car. Some people are like us. You live on used cars, Right? And either way, praise God. Because if you're living within your means, you will live a much more free life and you can love people and serve people. And this is super important into an American culture that is deeply in debt to others. Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another, for he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, verse 9, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet it. And if there's any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, this is the Ten Commandments. This is the very thing that most people don't think they'll be judged by and will be judged by. This is the very thing that we think, man, that's stiff, that's rigid, that's legalistic, that Jesus says, this is love, this is kindness, this is putting others first. You see, to a selfish culture, what you do is you take the Ten Commandments and you break the first two by making a God in your own image. You say, well, I want a God who approves of my selfishness. So you break the first and the second commandment by making a Jesus who's not the Jesus of the Bible, but a Jesus who seemingly looks a lot like you. In fact, a Jesus that approves of your selfish way of living. So you don't even have to change or repent. You can really live for yourself. And your Jesus, you remade in your own image, approves of it. Then you can go right down the list of the Ten Commandments, and you can selectively dismiss each one of them 
Because the Jesus you were made in your own image isn't like that. And the commandments are too old, too dated, too archaic. Rather than the timeless word always being timely, as though God wrote it this morning, it is looked at as a failed system that's being replaced by a much better one. There is no system that will ever replace God's system for goodness, holiness, justice, righteousness, kindness, and love towards others. Only God has that system. To the degree that you veer off course from that, you will always bring tyranny, hardship, heartache, brokenness, and suffering to this world. That's all there is. One day, this world will be governed by Jesus, and it will be a beautiful thing. We're going to see that here in a second. He brings that up, but he says, uh, love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the, anyone guess? Fulfillment of the law. Do you know if you lived a perfect selfless life, you would perfectly fulfill the law? Because that is what the law says. It is all about you dying to self, living for God and others. And if you can imagine the whole world where everyone was about loving God and others, what happens to the whole world? The whole world flourishes. What's wrong with our world? It's all about selfishness. You want to follow Christ? Rebel against selfishness and follow Christ through selfless service. The problem is, you and I have a default mode in our flesh. What is it? Selfishness. Selfishness. You feel that? You feel it in your own heart? Like, wow, I have still every propensity simply to be selfish, to spend my time, effort, energy, and money on myself rather than in service to others. So we have to die to self and live to Christ. He says, do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep. Do you think some people are in a spiritual slumber, kind of lethargic in their spiritual life while being gorged on the world? Yeah, yeah. What does being gorged on the world look like where you kind of go into a, a lethargy or a spiritual slumber? What would that look like? You ever eat too much like at Thanksgiving and you're just like, oh, I don't want to move. You think that happens spiritually? Yeah. No? Just spend your time being entertained by the world, listening to it, watching it. Spend your time just scrolling your phone. Spend your time just for what you want to do today. Eat what you want. Spend your time on you. It's you, you, you. The world says that's wonderful. That's called selfishness to God. And it's sinful, and it will actually destroy you. It won't lead to life. Jesus says if you give up your life, you'll gain it, right? But if you try to keep it, you'll lose it. So you give your life instead to going, no, instead of what my flesh wants to do, I'm going to follow the Spirit. I'm going to read the Word. I'm going to pray. I'm going to serve people. I'm going to love people. I'm going to try to make my life about others and let the Holy Spirit guide me in that direction. He says, do this knowing the time is already the hour for, for you to awaken from sleep. For now, salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. Do you see, the darkness is going to pass away, right? When Jesus came the first time, he says, light has come into the world and men love what? Darkness rather than light. Why? Because they're selfish. When you watch the news, do you ever see people carrying out selfishness? Yep. But it's not just criminals and crime that's selfish. Everyone's selfish. Only in Christ can we rebel against that selfishness that we are naturally inclined to be and actually live a selfless servant life which is what God says we're to do in fulfillment of all that he has said in the word and in the law. The night is almost gone, verse 12. Isn't that an encouragement, by the way? The day is near. You see, if you're in the darkness, you ever been in a night where you're just like, I cannot wait for this night to break. I cannot wait for daylight to come, right? Whether you were really sick and you just thought, man, if the day would just come, I can get up and go outside and breathe some fresh air. Have you ever had, or just you're miserable, you're going through suffering and devastating things in your life and it's so dark and you just can't wait for the daylight to dawn. And there's just something about the day that makes life much better. Like, oh, I can breathe. Oh, that night's gone. Oh, the daylight's shining. Oh. That's true collectively for mankind. It's current darkness, but the day is about to dawn. It's currently evil, but Jesus is coming. It's currently problematic and broken, but Jesus the healer is going to restore. He's going to come back. That's the testimony of the Bible. And since this is near, he's saying, you and I need to rebel against the selfishness of the world and become a servant to this world because the day of, day of light is about to dawn. 
Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So instead of being selfish, we put on the armor of light. You can look at the book of Ephesians to deal more with this put on armor of light. We're like putting on, in fact, he says this, putting on Christ. He says, uh, let us behave. What is he in in verse uh, 13? He says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing or drunkenness or in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Selfishness is always lustful. It's always after the wrong things. It's always after gratification of the flesh and the immediate satisfaction. I want to feel this and I want to feel good and I want it now and it's this. Serving Christ is always dying to those things and saying no to those things and saying yes to Jesus and saying yes to our creator and saying, no, he's right. The things I'm feeling are wrong. He's telling me the truth. The things I'm thinking are a lie. He is the one who's giving the correct path. These other paths are simply to destruction, right? Mm. And so what we need to do is say, wait a minute. If everything that God's about is us loving him and others and being a servant, and everything I would naturally be about is all myself and selfishness, then how do we do this, right? And so he says, um, let us behave. So he's not talking about belief. Behavior is the outcome of belief. Remember Romans 6, sanctification is consider yourself dead to sin and then present yourself to God. Remember it's it's up here, it's our mind, and then our actions. It's our thinking, and then our behavior, right? So he's talking about how we're to, to act. He says, let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness and sexual promiscuity, right? Not in strife and jealousy. This is all the world is about. If you watch any movies, typically that's exactly what entertains us as well. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So literally, what he's talking about for Jose today is, Jose is to put on Christ, Jed is to put on Christ, and Daniel is to put on Christ, and I'm to put on Christ. And this idea of putting on, it's as though you're taking off old clothes. You're taking off dirty clothes, and you're putting on clean clothes, right? Except it's using it symbolically to say you're putting off profanity, and immorality, and drunkenness, and gluttony, and anger, and strife. And what are you putting on? You're putting on peace, and gentleness, and wisdom, and truth, and holiness, right? And make no provision. This idea, the term really speaks to a plan. You see, most of the sinful things you do were because you allowed yourself to be in a circumstance. You allowed yourself to be looking at things, or thinking on things, and dwelling on things that ultimately became for you sin, and evil, and wickedness, right? You're to think about, you're to plan for putting on Christ. You're to make a plan for that. So if you're going to put on Christ tonight, probably need to make a plan to say, wow, I better not watch this tonight. I better not be alone with my phone tonight. I better not, whatever it is that you're tempted to do, I better not, if it's gluttony, I better not go hit the refrigerator and just eat myself to death tonight. If it's immorality, I better not be on my phone. You're making a plan to put on Christ. You're making a plan to put on holiness in your speech and your thoughts and your actions. You're making a plan for it. Otherwise, your flesh will make a plan for you, right? And you'll start slowly thinking on things, going places, being with people, and doing things that will ultimately tank you in selfishness. And instead of rebelling against the selfish world, you're embracing a selfish world. Instead of rebelling against those things that is destroying the world, you're embracing the things that are destroying the world and you as well. Jesus is right. Jesus spoke truth. Jesus brings healing. Jesus brings hope. Jesus brings joy. Jesus not only forgives us the things we did against others, he heals us from the things done against us. Jesus wants to make you whole. Jesus wants to make you holy. Jesus wants to make you his follower. Jesus wants you to fully walk in his footsteps. But that requires making a plan to rebel against our natural selfishness, right? Mm. And we should not be procrastinating. The night is almost gone. The day is about to dawn. Hebrews says it this way. Today, if you hear his voice, do not, does anyone know? Don't harden your heart. It's as though this timeless word is timely today, as though God's voice is calling out to you today to leave whatever selfish things that you're inclined to be about, the things that have entangled you. Hebrews, Hebrews 12 says, this sin that so easily entangles us, 
and let us run with endurance the race set before us. So there's things in each of our life we're inclined to do that are super selfish and are all about me. And God says, today, if you hear my voice, today, the day is coming, the night's almost gone, put away selfishness, rebel against the selfish world and live selflessly and be a servant to others. That means making a plan to say, man, what does it mean to serve others? Well, I need to encourage them. I need to pray for them. I need to help them. I need to share Jesus with them, right? These are the things why we're on this planet. We've been saved, and, we, we're, and yet we are waiting to go to the kingdom of God, our true home, because God has work for us to do. That work requires us to put aside selfishness and stop being selfish and start being servants and selfless, right? And so we put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. Here's the challenge. As I was talking to a guy, this was a long time ago, and he just kept looking at porno on his computer. And I told him, man, that is so selfish and sinful, you need to get rid of your computer. Oh, no, that would be legalism. No, no, like, if you ever hope to get married, you better get rid of this thing, man. Oh, no, I actually look up theology books on there, too. Yep. You know, you won't believe this. They, they actually make them in paper. Like, you can open the theology book and read it. I know that's hard to believe if you grew up on the screen. They actually make books. Get a book. Do away with the computer. No. There was always reason. So week after week, he'd show up. No, I looked at porno. I said, you know what I realized? You have no interest in giving up your sin. You love your sin. It is your closest friend. Jesus is so distant to you because you love your sin more than Jesus. You only want the gratification of your flesh. You don't want to serve Jesus. You only love following what you want to do because you're completely selfish. You don't want to give up your, these things and follow Jesus. I'll tell you what, I'll pray for you, but I can't help you. Only Jesus can do that. The accountability is nothing if you don't want it. And so you just go your way. You either go destroy your life in your sin or turn to Jesus Give up your sin. Make choices that are hard because your flesh is going, this is my old friend, this computer. Throw it out, right? That's legalism. No. That's making no provision for the flesh. Well, he has a computer. Yep, and he's not looking at porno on his computer. So when you get to the point where you've had success, you can get a computer again, right? But you better get accountability. You see, Jesus is the reason we breathe today. Jesus is the reason our heart pumps blood today. Jesus is the reason we're on a ball zooming around the sun today. Jesus is the reason why this 100,000 light year thing called the Milky Way galaxy is zooming into dark, deep dark space today at some astronomical speed. Jesus is the reason everything and every molecule exists. It's Jesus. And if Jesus says that, that we're to make no provision for the flesh, that we're to make a plan to do away with selfishness and to serve him, we need to make a plan to do away with selfishness and serve him. Which means prayer, accountability, but you've got to be serious to do that, right? So I want to encourage you as you think about this idea of quit being selfish. We need to make a plan to be a servant. That's the opposite of selfish. A servant is about others. A selfish person about themselves. A servant cares about the needs of others. A selfish person cares about only their own needs. A servant cares about how other people are going to be affected in a positive way. A selfish person only thinks about what's in it for them. We live in a world that only thinks about what's in it for them, and we're following a, a, a Lord and a Savior who says, you just think about what's in it for me and others, and I'll make sure your life is blessed. Let's pray. Father, we come and we're thankful for the book of Romans. We, if we're honest, all feel that tendency in our flesh to make it about us, our comforts, our entertainment, our uh, whatever it is, our food and our, all of these things. And yet you've called us out of this world to come and be servants, to love you and others more than we love ourselves. God, we just pray your spirit would just in us, do it at work, convict us, encourage us. We want to be a servant. We want to be selfless. We want to rebel against the selfish world and become selfless. And you've given us the resources and given us the choice. Help us to make that choice. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.